community in the world? Well, these are interesting times. We're realizing that it's a big universe, there are lots of planets, undoubtedly lots of beings out there, and we're not as important as we'd like to think we are. And I think we're in for some big shocks when we become part of a galactic community and realize we're not the most advanced ones around at all. We've got a lot to learn. So I wish I could live long enough to see how much we learn. I'm getting old, but I've seen plenty and I've seen changes. And our, you know, there was a time when we thought there were only maybe 6,000 planets in the galaxy. Now we'd say, oh, six billion. <laughs> That changes things. Do you have a hope for human race in this planet? Do I have what? Hope. For I'm this an opti planet? I'm inherently an optimist, and I think man is smart enough to work his way out of most difficulties, not always easily. Uh, so I think we can adjust to a new reality, and I'm optimistic about that. That, that good sense will prevail. Uh, maybe that's foolish optimism, but because uh, man has often shown that he isn't very sensible. <laughs> but I, I think that the world of my great grandson will be a different world. I have a grandson, a great grandson, yeah. and uh, I am optimistic that we're we're going through a rough time right now, a very rough time. But I anticipate that we'll get through it and come out better at the other side. Yes, I gave a lecture on behalf of the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. Okay, and who invited you? They did. Oh, they did? Yeah. And you talk about? Dr. Phillips. Well, my usual melange of things. Uh, I, I start with from the position that after almost 60 years of study and investigation, I'm convinced that Earth is being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. Furthermore, we're dealing with a cosmic water gate, as I like to call it. Governments are covering up what they know, understandably in some instances. But, uh, and I try to make people aware that there's an enormous amount of evidence, data, solid information. It's not just lights in the sky. I don't care about lights in the sky. But I bring to the subject a peculiar background. I worked on more canceled government-sponsored research and development programs than anybody including uh, working on nuclear rocket engines for Westinghouse, working on nuclear airplanes for General Electric, uh, working on a study of fusion propulsion for deep space travel for Aerojet General. Uh, so I've had, and also working under security for 14 years. So I understand that secrets can be kept. I understand that advanced technology requires taking a fresh look at old ways of doing things. Uh, I was very pleased when I worked on the nuclear rocket engine. We tested, there were three different organizations, Westinghouse Astro Nuclear Lab, where I was, Aerojet General, and Los Alamos uh, National Laboratory. We each tested a successful nuclear rocket engine. And people look at me, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, yeah. Uh, the Los Alamos one was the most impressive. It was only about this big in diameter, but the power level was over 4,000 megawatts. Hoover Dam produces 2,000, so you get some idea. This is a, and the exhaust temperature, liquid hydrogen goes in very cold, comes out very hot, 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So it was a remarkable program. They canceled it after we were finished. We, we had a successful test. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> but uh, so I, I have come at the problem from a sort of different view than most people. I have never seen a flying saucer. I have not been abducted by aliens. I know people who have been, but, uh, uh, but I try to rely on the, on the scientific method. As a nuclear physicist, and that's not just my claim, I have bachelor's and master's degrees in physics from the University of Chicago. Uh, I try to have ask the right questions, gather the data, evaluate the evidence on the basis of scientific method. And it is clear to me that our view of ourselves 
we earthlings, uh, has changed. It wasn't too many years ago that Frank Drake was talking about there might be 6,000 places in the galaxy that could send radio signals to us. Well, today, thanks to the Kepler spacecraft, we know that there's about 1.6 planets per star. So within 100 light years of here, which isn't very far, the galaxy is 1,000 light years, uh, within 100 light years of here, there are about 10,000 stars, and therefore about 16,000 planets. So it's pretty much possible to have a life somewhere there. Uh, one expects that there are lives. We, there's, there's nothing we know about ourselves that makes us unique. Mm -hmm. You know, that a man only happened here. Mm -hmm. That may be a good uh, religious view for some people, but the fact of the matter is that uh, you can make a good case that there's life all over the place. And also we learned that, gee, the nearest star to the sun is 4.3 light years away. That's a long distance. But there are plenty of stars in the neighborhood that have other stars less than one light year away. Uh, and presumably, the closer you are to your neighboring uh, solar system, the more likely you are to want to find out what's going on over there. Because they may attack us. They may have something we need or want. Uh, they may come to attack us or we them. Uh, so we're in isolation. But when we throw into the picture, you know, there's another number that's changed drastically. Uh, it was thought for some time a uh, minister back in the 17th century, mid 17th century, that mankind was created, Bishop Usher, man was created in 4004 BC. That's only 6,000 years ago, so not a long time. But the real picture is the Earth has been around at least 4 billion years, and the neighborhood maybe 13 billion years. So there's been plenty of time for things to happen whether it's uh, colonization, migration, just plain development, uh, whatever, destruction, rebuilding, uh, all, all kinds of things. Also, it takes us out of the center of things. We'd like to think how important we are, but are we? I don't think so in the larger scheme of things. We do represent a threat to the neighborhood, and I expect that other civilizations in our neighborhood would be concerned about us. You know, look, look at our track record. World War II, we killed 50 million of our own kind. We destroyed 1,700 cities. We're not very nice. So I, I would expect, also, we have exploded 2,000 nuclear warheads on this planet. And we've developed nuclear technology for ships. Uh, people look at me like I'm crazy when I say, you know, we have aircraft carriers that can go for 18 years they can operate without refueling. 18 years for a ship. What human civilization looks like is growing in more in evil than to make good things, to develop spiritually or technological or... It's something we all need to look at and to recognize that we all need to collectively think in terms of us being earthlings. Not Americans, Russians, Greeks, Peruvians, whatever. But as beings on a planet with lots of other beings on the planet, and probably in a sea of neighborhoods and planets of other beings and so forth. And, you know, I don't have much patience with the SETI cultists, as I call them, SETI, silly effort to investigate, not search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They're waiting for signals. We have no evidence that any signals are being sent. We have a great deal of evidence that we are being visited from all over the planet. Look, I've spoken in 19 countries, uh, 10 Canadian provinces, and all 50 states. I know there's tremendous interest in the subject, uh, but also ignorance and fear of ridicule. Uh, when I ask at the end of my lecture, as I frequently do, how many people here believe they've seen what I would consider to be a flying saucer? I've defined my terms in my lecture. Just raise your hand and we'll point me out. Typically, it's 10% of the audience believe they've seen one. But then I ask, how many of you reported what you saw? I'm lucky if it's one in ten. Ninety percent did. People are scared to talk about this. They're fearful of ridicule. Yeah. I'm trying to lift the laughter curtain out there to point out that there is data, there are facts, there is information. Forget all this nasty, noisy negativism from the people who say there's nothing to it. 
they haven't done their homework. Uh, uh, for example, I talk about five large-scale scientific studies. Uh, in a lecture that Dr. Seth Shostak of the SETI Institute attended, I asked about five large-scale scientific studies. How many people have read this? Tell what's in it. So he hadn't read any of them. That's typical. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. They can't possibly be real because if they were coming here, they'd want to talk to me. That's the attitude of the astronomers. Uh, so it's been interesting over the last, uh, I gave my first lecture in what, 1967. That's so 51 years ago. That's a long time and things have changed especially our recognition of how insignificant we are compared to what we thought we were. So, flying sauce is a fascinating subject. And it's fascinating because it touches on different notions of who we are. Are we going to destroy all invaders? Or maybe we were planted here somebody's colony a long time ago. I don't know. The fact of the matter is the planet's being visited. For good, bad, or indifferent, it doesn't matter. This is fact. Right. That's fact. Data. Well, I'll give you an example. I talk about the largest study ever done for the United States Air Force. Project Blue Book, special report number 14. The study was done way back in the 50s. The study was done by Battelle Memorial Institute in Columbus, Ohio. Very well-respected research and development organization. It's big. Thousands of people work for them. Uh, in the study, they put out a report, but the press release was, uh, how shall I put this, misleading. <laughs> there were lies in it. They said, on the basis of this study, we believe that no objects such as those properly described as flying saucers have overflown the United States. Even the unknown 3% could have been identified as conventional phenomena or illusions if more complete observational data had been available. Well, that sounds interesting. However, you look at the data in the report, which of course I did, the unknowns were 21.5% of the cases, not 3%. That's a big difference between 3 and 21.5%. Furthermore, they asked, is there any difference between the unknowns and the knowns? They did a chi-square analysis, a fancy way of saying, look at the different characteristics. What they found was the probability that the unknowns were just misknowns was less than 1%. So they also found the better the quality of the sighting, they looked at 3,201 cases. This work was done by professional scientists. They found that the better the quality of the sighting, the more likely to be unexplainable. They're the only ones we're interested in. And we're accustomed in science, at least in nuclear science, to deal with things that are only a small percentage but are very important. Uranium-235 is fissionable. That's good, but only Seven tenths of one percent of uranium is uranium 235, most of it's 238. During the war, we spent a lot of money to build a mile long facility to separate uranium isotopes, and we're using five percent of all the electricity produced in the United States, five percent, to separate those isotopes in secret. Nobody knew what we were doing. And why? Why? To build an atomic bomb. Oh. It was not going to be easy because you want 235 yeah, and there's yeah, not much of it there. Yeah. So, okay, we can separate the isotopes. It's going to cost a little money, etc. But we did it. And the stealth aircraft program by Lockheed was spent $10 billion over 10 years to develop the stealth aircraft in secret. Our first spy satellite was the Corona spy satellite. It flew for 30 years. The first 12 launches were failures. 12 launches. It's a lot of money. A lot of money, but the 13th work. And it got more data about Soviet military construction than all the U-2 flights that had preceded it. So it was worth it. So we have a history on this planet of doing things in secret, spending lots of money, uh, and sometimes succeeding. Not always. <laughs> Not always at all. So I I'm fully aware of these things because I was part of the action, so to speak. And I'm constantly trying to make effort to enlighten people about the facts as opposed to the mythology. Flying saucers are real. They're intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. And they're keeping an eye on us. And I don't blame them. Our history 
gives nobody any reason to to uh, trust us to do what is good. Uh, that sounds good, but it's not how we've behaved. Uh, and it saddens me. I don't know what the kids learn in school, but in World War II, we nice guy earthlings killed 50 million people. We destroyed 1,700 cities. We have, since the war, exploded 2,000 nuclear weapons. Only two on people, thank goodness. But that's the reality of the situation. So I don't blame aliens for being concerned about the idiots on Earth. Look what they're doing. Maybe we're threat for them. Well, it, it's perfectly clear. For the space. Nuclear fusion is what produces almost all the energy in the universe. That's also H-bombs. And when it turns out that we have exploded 2,000, nuclear weapons, not all of them, H-bombs, some atomic bombs as opposed to hydrogen bombs. Uh, of course they'd be concerned about us. Bigger and better rockets that kill more and more people. So I don't blame anybody for being distrustful. The major powers have spent a lot of money. The, the military budget on planet Earth this year is a trillion dollars. Think how many starving children you could feed for 10%. <laughs> You've been many times in the uh, White House for this public hearing with congressmen. Did that change something? I don't know that it changed. It made more people aware, still a small number, of the evidence about flying saucers. Uh -huh. As it awakened the planet, the, the New York Times, until the recent release uh, six weeks ago or so, uh, did not give fair coverage to the subject. This time they did and it created quite a sensation. It turns out there was a secret effort going on for like seven years uh, looking at UFO sightings. And we haven't had the full story on what was found during the course of that effort yet. Hopefully that'll come out at some point. So for people who think secrets can't be, can't be kept, you're wrong. They have been kept. I mean, I fully understand that it's a matter of national security, some sure. stuff. But there's something else, I think, is cover up. Why they don't still keep the secrets for national security? Because it's okay. But to open these files for these visitors, for this extraterrestrial visitations, the UFO, why they still keep that secrets maybe if they open that that will open much more questions and maybe they'll be ashamed to answer of these questions well one thing is there are darn few groups on this planet that think of themselves as earthlings nationalism is the only game in town and new technology is always in the service of nationalism national power glory whatever you want to call it ignominy <laughs> uh, so I can't justify the secrecy. Maybe they know something so terrible that we're going to be wiped out in 10 years, so why, why bother to tell us now? You know, live, live your life in peace until the big day comes. I, I don't know. I can't give you a good excuse for it. A former military guy I had a conversation. He said back in the years, 50s, 60s, he said um, we had a command first shoot and then ask. Ask first, shoot later. Uh, no, first shoot and then ask. <laughs> okay. Shoot first, yes. Yeah. Ask questions later. Because it's kind of... Okay. They're going to attack us if we don't attack them. Right. Yeah. We don't have an attitude on the planet that we're all in this together. This pretty blue ball, as somebody once described, is a place for all of humanity. And we need to recognize that there are other humanities out there. And they can't all be destructive or there wouldn't be so many of them coming around. So I'm an optimist, even though I'm 83 years old. Uh, I've spoken to over 700 audiences. I've been very well received uh, all over the world. And I'm very pleased about that because uh, that article, the big article in the New York Times back December 16th, I think it was, mentioned that there had been a secret program ongoing for seven years that we hadn't heard about at all. And we only spent $22 million on investigating sightings. That's peanuts. 
but still, it's the first time that was revealed after all these years. And so maybe we're slowly getting on the right track to recognize that we're part of a galactic community. There are other things to do better than kill people. Fusion can be used for propulsion. I worked on a study in 1962, of, and the basic conclusion was if you have the money, you can go. Lots of money. Dr. Stephen Greer talked about the free energy. I haven't seen any evidence that he knows where it comes from or has I mean, been able to produce it. I mean, they're just looking for free energy. It, it sounds good, free energy. Uh -huh. yeah. Show me. I mean, I, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> well, I am, and I haven't seen any evidence for yeah. it. Interesting thought. Uh -huh. uh, who are going to make that disclose? The government, the scientists, or social media? Well, at some point it's got to be governments because they got the power to reveal the secrets. It's against the law to reveal classified information to somebody who doesn't have an appropriate clearance or need to know. That's breaking the law if you do that. So, and that's true in all countries, it's not just the United States. So, at some point, the powers that be, political powers on the planet, have to decide. It's time we open the books told the world what's going on. We had a good start uh, mid-December. And I'm waiting for the next shoe to drop. I think there will be another shoe. Do you think that human race is ready to hear that? Yes. Look, after 700 lectures, which I have given, and all of which I've taken a very strong stand, that some UFOs are alien spacecraft. Yes, I'm convinced that the public can handle that. The world didn't go crazy when the first atom bomb was dropped. We were so glad the war was going to be over, and it, which it was a week later. Uh, so I think the world can handle it. There will be people who will be unhappy. There are always people who will be unhappy about any decision made about national security. That's the way mankind is. You know, take four Earthlings and you get five opinions. It's, so I think we can handle it. I mean, I, I, as I say, I've spoken all over the place. Yeah. And I, nobody's throwing uh, things at me. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that scientists looking in different, I mean, the wrong way about these extraterrestrials? I mean, you said they're waiting for some signal from somewhere. <laughs> do you think that this is the right way for looking for extraterrestrial life? Well, I, I think it's the best way we have. It's yeah. the only way we have. Yeah. Here we have clear and present evidence from all over the world, from very respectable observers, that we're being visited by intelligently controlled extraterrestrial spacecraft. That doesn't tell us where they come from. It doesn't tell us what they want, what they think about us. It, it doesn't matter. The data is there that we're being visited. Now, we should be able to come to terms with that within our own governments, and to say to them, okay, what is it you want? What can we do to work with you? Recognizing that one of the things would be to give up your battlefield attitude. Shoot first, ask questions later. Mm -hmm. That's not the way responsible members of a larger society act toward each other or should act toward each other. Like a scientist, what kind of suggestion you can give to the other scientists in the world about this uh, disclosure about all this well, looking for intelligence. Do your homework is the first thing. Look at the large-scale scientific studies. I checked my audiences. Fewer than 2% have read any of the large studies. An opinion not based on the facts is not a worthwhile scientific opinion. So it's time to admit you haven't done your homework, but now you're ready to go. And it's time that all around the planet, not just the United States, but the Russians that British, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Chinese especially, India. Uh, it's time we all recognize that something's going on here, very important, very big. Mm -hmm. Let's do something about it. Maybe scientists need to be much more open to talk about this. Sure. Because, because the, I mean, the UFOs already, I mean, not already, but almost landing in the White House area, and the scientists still waiting for some signal from the space. <laughs> That's crazy, yes. 
I mean, social, social media is walking maybe 10 steps front of the scientists in this case. That's not surprising. Look, uh, Kathleen Martin and I, we've written three books. One of them is Science Was Wrong. Yeah. It has 14 chapters covering a wide range of areas, medicine and social science and political science, etc. And it, it's perfectly clear that down through history, there have been the very smart guys who say this is nonsense. In 1902, two months before the Wright brothers' first flight, uh, a great American astronomer said that if there was one thing he was certain of, man would never fly any distance in a vehicle. Wright brothers' flight was two months later. In 1956, a different great scientist said that space travel is utter bilge. No good will come from it. Who will pay for it? What we need is better equipment for astronomy. Sputnik went up the next year, and the field that's benefited the most from the space program has been astronomy. So, down through history, there have been smart people saying stupid things because they haven't been willing to admit that they haven't done their homework. It's time to do our homework. Do you, do you think the Russians is more open than that? Not especially. Because I have another impression that they Maybe they go more in public to talk about it's like Mr. Ajaja. I don't know if you heard about well, him. Well, yes, I know who Ajaja is. I think the Russians are interested. I think they're willing to speak about it. They are certainly as aware of the technological implications. If you develop advanced propulsion systems and stuff like that, you can use it to bomb the Kremlin. You know. Uh, so. I, I, I'm not going to try to evaluate the civilizations on the planet. The leadership in all of them is unwilling to take on the question of, okay, where do we stand in the galactic neighborhood, not just in our solar system? Mm -hmm. That's an important question. It's time we got with it. United Nations, I touched about the United Nations twice. We should be doing more along those lines. Looks like they don't want to do anything about this. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. It's the, their attitude. But that's changing. The younger generation is ready, willing, and able, I think. I'm an optimist. Maybe European, uh, maybe European Union will open some program about this. I, I don't know. I'll do what I can. Yeah. And the last, the last part of this conversation about your friend Professor Filippo from Bulgaria. Uh, Bulgaria Scientists of Academy, they persecuted him because he talking about UFO. I mean, his life is not threat, but his job in Bulgarian Academy is, I mean, this is very, I'm sorry about very that. bad. And what can I do? I gave my lecture. It was well received. Other people got upset about it. Yeah. I do my thing. They'll do theirs. Yeah. But how you can explain that? Science has always had built-in prejudice about extrapolating the past from the past to produce the future. In reality, it doesn't work that way. Progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. Uh, you know, vacuum tubes and radios and television and stuff like that. Now we got transistors, we got integrated circuits, entirely different way of achieving the same ends. We have to recognize that that's the way things are. If we don't want to join in the progress, get off the train. Or maybe just some jealousy? There are personal factors in all decisions made on this planet. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody wants the launch pad in their district. Uh, who knows? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And the last question. What kind of lesson humanity is supposed to learn? What kind of homework needs to be done? Well, I... I could, I could provide somebody in a day and a half with source material for them to learn the truth. The documents are there, the reports are there, the studies are there. You got to open the book before you know what's in it. And so, uh, do your homework. That would be the simplest thing. That's what's needed to get the job done. People to educate themselves yes. for everything and asking questions. Oh yes, asking <laughs> questions is key. Okay, thank you very much for your time. And uh, really, we'll, uh, we are very happy to have you. My pleasure. <laughs>